Thanks so much for joining us at Vive Church for our podcast. If you have a story to share about what God's doing in your life or how this ministry has blessed you, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email at mystory@vivechurch.org. Enjoy today's message. I'm so glad that you came out for Vision Sunday. I really am. Uh, I'm really... Can, we, can you welcome yourselves? Why don't you welcome yourselves? Let's welcome San Jose. Let's welcome Palo Alto, San Francisco, and our online campus. God's speaking. He's already doing so much, but I believe he has more in store. Would you look at your neighbor, no matter where you are right now, and just look him in the eyes and say, there's more in store for you. Come on, there's more, there's more in store. I like to rhyme and I like to rap, even though I'm white. You got it. I know. I plan on doing a few things today. I, for one, I plan on sharing the vision for the next 12 months of our church, and I'm excited about that. And after the worship experience today in all of our locations, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond to the, to the vision. We're going, to, we're going to do that after the worship experience, which is going to be a powerful moment. But I also want to preach a simple sermon to you that God revealed to me this week. And I have to confess something to you. I know that's not the greatest way to start out a sermon by any means with confession. But, but, but needless to say, I need to confess that last week I... I mentioned that we were closing out the series. You know how bold I was about that. We brought it to a close. Well, God arrested me this week and said, you're done when I say you're done. It's pretty much what He said. And I want to remain obedient and faithful to God, even though I prepared a killer Vision Sunday message last month. I put that to the side because God wanted to extend our series one more week. And since He is God, we say yes. Amen. And so uh, I'm extending the series one more week, one more week, our For Real series. And and, and, and I'm wondering, can you handle that this morning? Is that okay? Can you handle that? One more, one more week. You thought we were done. Maybe you thought God was done in your life. He's not done yet. Amen. There's more that He wants to do. But I do want to set the atmosphere right as if it isn't already. And I want to read three short verses in Scripture while you stay standing. So if you happen to have a Bible, you could open up to Hebrews with me. Hebrews chapter 11. I want to read from the New Living Translation. And I want to read from verse 1. It says, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. What we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Now, now since this, and we're making this week six of our For Real series, I'm giving this sermon a prophetic title. Are you ready for it? I've decided to call this sermon, Now You Know. Now now you don't know just yet, but by the time we're done, you will know. So so that's why it's prophetic. And and maybe in preparation for the Word, you could ready your hearts by finding four people in honour of our fourth Vision Sunday in this church. And and look look at four people in the eye and, and just say, do I know you? Just why don't you do that real quick? And if you don't know them, introduce yourself. Introduce yourself. Do I know you? Come on, San Francisco. Come on online. Find somebody. Do I know you? Do I know you? You know, over the past six weeks, we have been camped in 2 Corinthians where... Paul has been somewhat defending his authority as an apostle, but also exposing counterfeit or false apostles who have been corrupting the church. And his game plan was that, as we recently discovered, his game plan was to make sure that the church wasn't fooled. In other words, he wanted to make sure that the church was in the know. He wanted them to to be in the know. Does anybody like to be in the know? 
Anybody really like to know what's going on? You like to be on the inner crowd? You like to be on the receiving end of the information and knowing things that other people don't know? You like that? I wonder, as a result of knowing stuff, how do you live differently in life? And maybe that is what explains your parenting technique. (laughs) Maybe that explains your parenting style because you know what you got up to as a kid. Just maybe. Just maybe. I know what I got up to as a kid. That is definitely what determines my parenting style. I have daughters, okay? So, so my parenting is a little different from my wife's parenting. She, she parents practically. I parent protectively. <laughs> Can I get an amen from all the dads of girls in here? I parent protectively. Not ashamed of it. Fear-based parenting, that's for sure. <laughs> But you know what's fascinating? Just the other day, we were actually having a conversation with one of our Vive youth leaders just about how do we, you know, it's a bit strategic conversation. We're thinking about how do we get, you know, access for for more young people to get to to Vive youth. And we're kind of just trying to problem solve. And and I just randomly threw, I didn't really think it through at the time, just was just being strategic. You know, in a creative meeting, there's no bad ideas, you know, until you have a bad idea. And then it's like, all right, that was a bad idea. And... uh, and, and, and I just threw out the idea, well, we could just put them on the train. You know what I mean? And we just put these high school students on the train, not thinking that they'd be coming back at 9.30 at night on the train. And, and then my daughter, who was eavesdropping, because that's what you do when you're a pastor's kid. You kind of listen into conversations. She just said, uh, uh, um, would you, Dad, would you let me get on a train at night? And then my wife chimed in, just kind of making my daughter aware that she's a little bit sheltered. Uh, She's like, honey, I don't think you have the street smarts to ride the train at night. (laughs) Without skipping a beat, she came straight back and said, mom, I got the street smarts not to even get on a train at night. (laughs) True story. True story. But there's something about knowing things, being in the know. I kind of think about how much I know now as a husband and how that changes the way I understand women. I've been married 14 years. Yeah, applaud her. That's amazing. But being married 14 years, you know what I know about women? Nothing. Not a single thing. And I emphasize the importance of knowing things and what we do know and what we don't know because this whole series has been designed to grow you in such a way in your faith that you would know what's possible in this life. And what we've witnessed in this series is the power of God on display through the Israelites as they have have kind of entered into the promised land, which incidentally was also enemy territory. That can kind of be confusing and conflicting somewhat in life when you realize that the same land that God has given you and promised you is often occupied by the enemy that you have to make, go through a fight to get what God has already given you. Kind of sounds funny. That what God has given me, I still have to fight for. This certainly confused the Israelites. We've seen this through their journey into the promised land. And we've been connecting their story and their situations and the circumstances that they face with how our lives, similarly, we have to, have to overcome fear and uncertainty in our lives. And what's been fascinating to me is how we've explored just how much fear we face that actually comes from the unknown. And in Hebrews, we see a clear connection between faith and the unseen. But something that I did not want to do and leave in this series, and maybe this is why God wanted us to, wanted us to continue the series, is what I did not want is to leave, leave room for confusion by connecting faith to the unseen to leave people thinking that we're meant to have a blind faith. That's not what the Bible's referring to. That's certainly not what Hebrews is referring to. By connecting faith with the unseen is not saying that we're meant to have a blind faith. In fact, it's saying not a blind faith, but a bold faith. Because check out what it says. It says faith is the confidence that we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. In other words, he's talking about a confidence beyond what we can see, beyond it. Not just being confident in what we can see and what we can attribute and what we can analyse, but even beyond our deepest wisdom, we can have a confidence in this life. And what God has been speaking to me about this week And what I want to teach you this morning is how do we be bold, not blind? Or maybe a a more spiritual way to put it, because you're also spiritual. How do we see the unseen? And who thinks that just maybe, 
Joshua could still possibly hold some keys for us today. How many people have been growing with Joshua over this series? Me too. I, I, I like Joshua. I'm kind of growing fond of Joshua. Joshua's a hero in the faith. And we started out in Joshua chapter 6. We, we looked in Joshua chapter 6 at the walls of Jericho. We, we marched around with the Israelites. We saw the walls come down. That was in Joshua chapter 6. Now I want to go to Joshua chapter 10. And what we see is something interesting. Would you turn there with me? Joshua chapter 10. I want to read from verse 1. It says, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured and completely destroyed Ai and its king, killed its king, just as he had destroyed the town of Jericho and killed its king. He also learned that the Gibeonites had made peace with Israel and now were their allies. He and his people became very afraid when they heard all of this because Gibeon was a large town, as large as the royal cities and larger than Ai, and the Gibeonite men were actually strong warriors. So King Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem sent messages to several other kings. Let's go to verse 4. Come and help me destroy Gibeon, he urged them, for they have made peace with Joshua and the people of Israel. So these five Amorite kings combined their armies for a united attack. They moved all of their troops into place and attacked Gibeon. The men of Gibeon quickly sent messengers to Joshua at his camp in Gilgal. Don't abandon your servants now, they pleaded. Come at once, save us, help us. For all the Amorite kings who live in the hill country have joined forces to attack us. Now to fully understand the situation that Joshua is in, we need to previously understand as we discovered last Sunday that, that Joshua made the mistake of being fooled by the Gibeonites into a peace treaty with them. Do you remember that? All of you with perfect attendance over this series, you'd know that. And we learned that what Joshua did is he, he fell for the trap of the Gibeonites who, they, they faked them out, they, they, they played them as a fool and, and, and they kind of pretended to be from a distant land just in order to make a peace treaty, even though they were nearby them. Yeah. And what the Bible says is that Joshua made the mistake of examining their food, but not consulting the Lord. Oh, he made a mistake. He, and now the whole nation is forced into battles that don't belong to them. Yeah. They're forced into battles that aren't theirs because of the mistake that Joshua made. A foolish mistake. That is, that, is, that is now plaguing their nation. They're bound by a treaty, a battle because of this treaty that they now have to engage in. And what's different about this setting than every other battle that they faced is that every other battle that the Israelites faced up until this point has been at the command of God. Wow. God had called them into every other battle. And when God calls you into a battle, there is a sense of comfort that comes with that. No matter how crazy the battle seems, because God called me, surely I have the comfort to know that God's going to be with me. You know what I'm talking about. Because after all, the battle is the Lord's. The battle is not yours, right? But what about when the battle is yours? What about when the fight that you're in comes from the fight you got yourself in? What about when the fight that you're in comes from a series of mistakes that you made? What if the fight you're in is from your own dumb debt? Maybe it's a, a divorce or, or maybe it's some dumb decision that you made some time in life, but now you're living in the thick of the battle from that. Well, what happens in those seasons where now yeah, you're having the fight of your life? Because here, here we've got Joshua, who is now in an awkward position from a previous poor decision. Sometimes the miracle that we're believing for is simply to get me out of the mess that I made. Do you know what I'm talking about? I was hoping I could talk to a real church today. Not just one of those spiritual churches that only fight Victoria's battles. But you know the, the mess you get yourself into. And if you know anything about the enemy, you realize that his aim is to disqualify your confidence. That's really what he wants to do. He wants to, he wants to take your confidence. That's how he works. But I want to do something Today, I don't want to just show you how the enemy works in your life. More importantly, I want to show you how God works even through our mistakes in this life. Maybe I could put it another way. And maybe I could be as bold and go on record, because this is what happens when you preach. Things go on record against you. But I'm going to say it anyway. I believe that some of the greatest miracles are actually born out of our gravest mistakes.
Uh, you'll get that on the way home. <laughs> because this is what we see with Joshua. Joshua is now in, a, now in a battle that came out of a mistake that he made. It wasn't his fight, but yet because of the treaty and because of the season of mistake that he was in, he's now in a mess. But even though he got himself into the mess, we're going to see how God will get him out of it. And I love that understanding in this life that God loves us no matter how the mess came about. His plan is to still restore us and redeem us and deliver us. That's how good our God really is. Yeah. Okay. Now, I need you to go with me today. As where I want to take you is, is what God has been showing me all week. And, 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 and as I said, God kind of hijacked my plans. I had a really awesome Vision Sunday message prepared for you. And then God said, no, we're preaching this. So, so I'm, I'm going to need to kind of weave in and out of Scripture a little bit. We're going to kind of like lace a shoe up. We're going to tie it with a bow at the end. It's going to be amazing. But I need you to track with me, okay? So I don't need you talking to your neighbor. I don't need you having your own discussions. You can talk back to me. That's allowed. But, but, but don't talk to anybody else this morning. Amen. So can we practice right now? Just say amen, Pastor. We're with you. Okay. And what I need you to know, and I, I want to I preach about this, because what we see here is the Israelites enter a battle and God powerfully shows up in, in an incredible way, causing Joshua and the Israelites to have this monumental victory. I mean, this was the victory to end the war as we know it. This was the, the catalyst to, to changing the promised land from occupied by the enemy to occupied by God's People. This was the this was the this was the Armageddon battle. We're talking about the big one. But God came through miraculously, and, and what we see in verse 12 is one of the greatest miracles recorded in the Bible, which also happens to be the reason why Joshua was victorious. It says this in verse 12: on, on the day the Lord gave the Israelites victory over the Amorites, Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of all the people of Israel. He said, Let the sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Aelon. So the sun stood still and the moon stayed in place until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. Wow. Wow. Oh, you know I'm going to preach this, okay? <laughs> but I kind of need to bookmark this for a moment and I need to parallel it with another passage in Scripture. So, so maybe we could go to the New Testament for a moment because I got I to gotta build some swell around it. We can't just come at this from this altitude. We need to climb a little bit. So, so, so I need to talk to you about Jesus for a moment. That will get us there. Yeah. Yeah. We, we see in Mark chapter 4, a story concerning Jesus where He and the disciples are in a boat going across the lake to the other side. And what we see is Jesus finds Himself, well, the disciples find themselves in a storm. Right. Jesus is asleep in the boat. And what we encounter in the story is that the disciples are so frustrated with Jesus and they frantically come to Him, waking Him up saying, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown? You know the story. And in a fascinating display of capability and authority, Jesus simply steps up to the front of the boat, speaks one word, and I don't think He shouted, I think He just spoke. And on the other side of that speaking, the waves die down and the wind ceases. And then Jesus, we see in Scripture, turns to the disciples and says, why are you still afraid? Do you not have faith? Do you not have faith? Do you not believe? And it's interesting because what we see in Scripture is a powerful example of what Jesus is capable of. The amazing authority that Jesus possessed to, to overcome even the wind, the waves, the elements, the very atmosphere, the universe, whatever causes the, the wind to blow and the waves to rise, the, the tide to come in and the tide to go out. Jesus shows that He has authority over those things. And as a result, He simply asked the disciple, why, why are you afraid? How is it that you can still have fear? And, and this is interesting because I want to kind of continue on because, because even though the gospel writers and they, they, they put this together and, and the Septuagint, they, they kind of form the Bible that we know it. They put a chapter marker in here, but the story doesn't stop here because we see that the boat gets to the other side. And when it gets to the other side, Jesus and the disciples encounter a, a man filled with evil spirits comes out of a cemetery. It's kind of like a really good uh, Halloween sermon this would make because what we're about to see is what the disciples encounter. And, and, and I want to read this in Mark chapter 5, verse 3. It says, This man lived among the burial caves and, and could no longer be restrained even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. 
No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him and bowed low before him. And with a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the Spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, What's your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, because there are many of us inside the man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the Spirit begged. Let us enter them. So verse 13, Jesus gave them permission and the evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. Verse 14, the herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane and they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what had happened told the others about the demon possessed man and the pigs and the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. Again, we see a powerful display in Scripture of the authority of Jesus. That even over the evil spirits, His very presence caused them to cower. And, and it's an amazing display, but, but something that has confused me as a studier of Scripture and I don't know how you read Scripture. I don't know how you read passages if you, if you get to the hard stuff and just read over it, but that kind of catches me up. And the question that I have and have been confused about for some time is, why would Jesus be merciful to the demons? Why? He owed them nothing. Jesus didn't owe them anything. They, they plead in Scripture time and time again. We see for Jesus to have mercy on them, to, to not send them into the abyss where they came from, but to simply send them into the pigs. And it can kind of be confusing because here are the very demons that have been torturing one of God's people. They've been torturing, they've been had him stripped naked, beating himself, howling, living outside of the city, tormenting him. And yet, yet they beg Jesus as if he owes them something to, to not cast them into the abyss, and this can kind of be confusing. Because after all, I look at this and I consider, surely Jesus knew that simply casting out the demons and not into the pigs, just sending them into an abyss would have had the same result, if not better. Right? I mean, let's, let's think about it. Let's analyze the story for a moment because had Jesus just simply cast out the demons, they, the man would have been set free. The, the, the villagers would have, have not been angry at the loss of their pigs. The disciples would have still been further amazed at the power of God. And, and let's be honest, He would have saved a whole lot of bacon and we know that that's glorious. <laughs> Yet, what we see in Scripture is that Jesus grants their wish. And it kind of had me confused and had me kind of frustrated and what I see and what God revealed to me, because these are the moments when you get stuck where you say, God, would you just show me? And what God showed me is that the decision to send the demons into the pigs had actually nothing to do with the demons. It had everything to do with the disciples. Because what the disciples did not need was another display of God's power. They saw that very clearly and evidently with the wind and the waves. They, they saw at the very Word of God how the wind died down and the waves died down. They obeyed the very command of God. They didn't need another display of His authority and of His, of His power. What He was showing them was another element that is a vital component to bold faith. Because the way that you respond to situations in life, the way that you respond to circumstances or fearful situations is a direct reflection of what you believe about two things. One, what you believe about the capability of God, what He can do. But not what you just believe about the capability of God, but also what you believe about His character. 
Because the capability is what God can do. His character has to do with why He will. Why He will. Why He will. Oh, let me unpack it a little bit further. I know we're going deep on Vision Sunday, but, but this is going to help some people. Because what we see in Scripture is that this very decision to send the demons into the pigs, Jesus knew, obviously, He knows some things. He can prophetically know the future. He, he knew that the result would be the same, that the pigs would run into the ocean and drown. And as a result, the, her, the whole villages were angry with Him, rejecting Him. And it's interesting, and I, and I kind of thought about it. I thought, you know what? Maybe we missed the emphasis of why the villagers were so angry in our 21st century perspective as we just read over Scripture like a cute story. But, but I thought we'd go a little bit deeper and maybe we could put ourselves in the villagers' shoes to really understand the emphasis of the situation. So I did a little bit of research on the price of pigs. Well, I didn't do the research. My team did, but it's like me doing it anyway. And I said, I want to find out what the price of a pig is today. I didn't know if you knew. I didn't know what the price of a pig is. So they went to research. They, I had them calling farms directly. They even looked on Craigslist to really know how much a pig costs. And, and I was a little bit surprised because what we found out is that at Kimber, Kimber Valley Ranch, a pot-bellied pig averages at $2,000 per pig. That's what I thought. And so I thought, surely there are some cheaper pigs because, you know, the pot... The pot-bellied ones have to be probably a bit more you know, yummy. I don't know, like, I don't know much about pigs, but maybe they're the expensive kind. So I said, do some more research. I'm not paying $2,000 per pig. And so what they went back and they found out that Haley's Piggy Village, that sounds cute. They sell the, just the average domestic pig, you know, the little pink babe style pig. They sell them for $500 per pig. Still, I thought that was a little bit expensive. And, and, and really what we found out is the best deal that they could get was one-off pigs on Craigslist. So if you're going to get 2,000 of them, that's a lot of searching. You know what I mean? You're going to be down there for a long time. But needless to say, the, the cheapest one-off pig they could get on Craigslist was $380 per pig. So the replacement value of 2,000 pigs today at the cheapest possible price would be $760,000 dollars. But so much higher to Jesus was the value of one life. So much higher was the value that he, he put on a man's life. No, he didn't need the disciples to, to get a greater understanding of what he's capable of. He needed them to see the, the character and the very nature that he puts a value on a person, that he puts a value on one life. And we see in Scripture time and time again, a clear understanding of the character and nature of Jesus through the parable of the lost coin, the lost son, the lost sheep, that Jesus puts value on the one. He will leave the 99 to go up after the one. That is illogical economy, my friends. Illogical. Yet Jesus has this kind of character. Now I need to come back to Joshua. I'm well aware of that. We've left bookmark in Joshua. I need to come back there. But, but before I can really preach about the sun standing still, I need you to know the gravity of what God is calling us to as a church in the next 12 months. So for a moment, could you bear with me while I share some vision? Is that okay? If you don't belong to this church, just bear with us. But, but I know for our church, we're really invested in this kind of thing. Yeah. We're really eager to know what God is calling us to and where God is leading us and really what we're going to commit to as a church. And you may not know, but over the last three years since launching the 5x5 vision, our approach has been to take it 12 months at a time. You know the old adage, how do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. It's kind of like, how do you, how do you achieve a crazy vision? Well, you just take it like 12 months at a time. And our overarching vision is five by five. In five years, we want to plant five campuses. And we're currently in year three of that vision. We've got three campuses. It's amazing. God is doing amazing things in San Francisco, doing awesome things. And San Jose, an amazing community. And now we're online, which is kind of cool. Kind of very cool. But we have been in an aggressive startup phase in the life of our church. And we are committed to staying aggressively startup in certain aspects of our church life, that's for sure. We're going to be aggressive in the way we advance the kingdom. We're going to be aggressive in the way we awaken people to a new reality in Jesus. We are not putting the brakes on at all in that respect. But we don't want to just stay startup in every area. We know that 
What God has been speaking to us is requiring, requiring some establishment as a church. And so something that God has been speaking to us as a leadership team is something that we're calling Project Vive. And simply put, Project Vive is a building initiative. It's a bricks and mortar account for future purchase of buildings in the Bay Area. And if you've been here for a little while, you know that the kind of size buildings that we need run about $30 million per building. And already we need three of them. So it's going to require a little investment. It requires us to be generationally minded. Not just immediately minded, but but being like farmers where you sow a seed, knowing that you're not going to reap the immediate harvest, but in time come, you're going to be very grateful that you spent time sowing seed for the harvest that may come. And I'm excited about what this means for your kids. I'm excited what it means for my kids. You might not even have kids, but just ask Vadim. They come quickly. Okay, they just happen. They happen real quick. You don't know. You may not know. They're coming. But we're going to keep sowing seeds. And something else you may not know, but you've probably been anticipating is that in the next 12 months, we're going to be launching our fourth campus of Vive Church. We're committed. And as an expansion team, we've been seeking God on the location. We've been trying to remain very strategic in our selection. And as a result, I'm excited to announce to you that our next campus will be known as Vive Oakland. Oh, praise Jesus, somebody. We ain't scared. Look at all you staying so cool, sitting in your seat, just like, oh yeah, so what? Okay. You know why I like that we've chosen Oakland because that's the very area that churches have avoided. Amen. Church planners have bypassed yeah. because of fear. And I kind of feel it's so vibe to go where others are afraid of. Yeah. To say, well, we'll go there. We'll go there. Yeah. Kind of baiting us to go into those places with a church. And I'm excited. We're putting a team together. We've got a small strategy that we've got in place. It's a simple strategy. We're going to kind of do something we're calling Vive Underground. We're in the lead up, we're going to launch in August 2017, but in the lead up, we're going to do a series of underground worship nights just to create a spiritual momentum in a place that is barren and dry and, and needs the, the move of the Holy Spirit and revival in that place. So we're going to do a whole series of Vive Underground. And, and with that, we also know that we need to upgrade our broadcast campus equipment. We've got cameras and lighting that, that we're at a tipping point right now in our church life where there are in our San Francisco campus and our San Jose campus are just as many people that are here present, uh, if not more already, that, that, you know what I mean, watch via the camera and as opposed to can yeah. smell my breath. You know what I'm talking about? So, so what, what we need to do is make sure that we upgrade everything so that we can continue to to deliver a high quality worship experience as we keep expanding as a church. And it's not cheap. <laughs> Extending the kingdom of God is expensive. And what you may not know is something else that God has been speaking to us about more recently is, is something that I want to present to you as a, also a part of our vision focus. And you may not know that the story of Vive Church is a unique one. It's a unique one because it's full of unique stories. And I love hearing the stories of how God has impacted the different people's lives through the ministry of Vive Church. It, it, it always has me just caught up in wonder and amazement. I'm more amazed than most people how God uses this church to influence people and, and help people and change people. And the stories are, are powerful. And what God reminded me of is the very way to overcome the enemy is by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Our stories hold power. And what's interesting is we see in Mark when, 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 when Jesus told this boy, to, to this man to go and tell everybody his story, it says that everyone was amazed. People are literally amazed at the transformation of a life. And I realize that we need to tell the story of changed lives because we know that behind every story is God's glory. And the greatest way to evangelize is to tell the story of a transformed life. Amen. And so what we're committing to is we're committing to creating short films that will leverage our digital reach 
to make sure we can evangelize not just some random person in the middle of nowhere by a sign on a billboard, but I'm talking about your Facebook contacts. I'm talking about your relatives. I'm talking about your co-workers. I'm talking about how they've seen you one way, but because of what Christ has done in your life, their whole perception of church changes. Their whole perception of what's keeping them out of church changes because they see a transformed life. And this is, all of this stuff, I mean, we need to put things into place and it's not cheap. (laughs) It's not cheap. To do what we need to do is going to cost around a million dollars in our church. And I'm so confident though that God can do it. I'm so confident that God can do this. God is able, amen. How many people know God is able? And I'm confident, but I'm, I'm also nervous because I know that when the minute that we begin to verbalize something, now we're accountable to do it. It's okay in the prayer room, but now we're accountable. My job though, I know, is simply to present the vision and allow you to respond. Allow you to respond to come around the vision because God's plan in achieving the vision is also to use His people. Have you ever considered that a sovereign God who can do anything He wants at any time that He wants, He still chooses to limit Himself through you? That's how He works. That's how He works. And so it's going to require us as a church to respond and we're going to commit as a church over a 12-month period, a 12-month pledge above and beyond the tithe. I'm not telling you to take God's money and then give it back to God. That already belongs to Him. But above the tithe, to say, God, we're going to be sacrificial as a church. We're going to respond with faith. And it's not going to be equal giving. It's equal sacrifice because everyone's at a different level of capacity in their giving. I know that. Some people, you, you might be at the level of, oh, I could really stretch in faith and give $10,000 over 12 months. Some people could write a $100,000 check just as the same level of sacrifice. I know that. But what God is looking for is, participation. He wants to mobilize you. Now, what we are not going to do is we are not going to have a moment in the worship experience to respond. That's not how I want to word this. This is not how I want to structure this. I'm not trying to do an emotional thing where in the hype of of the atmosphere, I get you to respond. No, no, we're going to do that after service in the kiosk where you can prayerfully consider what God is calling you to do. I want to use this time for something else. I want to build faith in your life. Because some of you might be in a position right now where you would say, Pastor, I'm just not in a financial position at all. I want to believe with you that 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 situation is going to change by faith. That you're not going to be in the same position three months from now or five months from now or six months from now. But because faith is built on the inside of you, things begin to change and shift around your life. So after the worship experience, they're going to respond. but, But I know God can do this. Can I encourage you with something? We held a a vision gala on Friday night. And we invited everybody, but we could only do 300 people. I apologize for that. Some people missed out. You've got to get in early next year. And and we just had 300 uh, leaders pretty much in the church who came along to that. And, And I like to do that where I can let leadership pioneer first and go forward in the church and set the atmosphere of faith and I pitched the sh- same vision. I just shared the same vision with them and, and they responded on Friday night. And I'm really encouraged to be able to share with you that what we've already got committed to the, to the pledge, to the, to the vision of the house is just short of $900,000 has already, has already been committed. Would you just stand and praise God by faith? Would you just, just applaud Him? That's faith. That's faith. That's faith. Amen. All right. All right. Now I can preach about Joshua. Now I can preach about Joshua. Sit down so I can preach. I need to preach. I got a couple minutes left on the clock, but I'm going to make every second of it count. Here we've got Joshua and what we've got recorded in Joshua chapter 10. I need my worship team. Oh, they're already here. I love this. Okay, because we're going to go right now. In Joshua chapter 10, we have got one of the most amazing miracles recorded in Scripture. Easily one of the most dynamic stories. 
stories where, where, where God caused the very sun to stand still for an entire day so that His people could get the victory. They had the upper hand. They had the advantage, but they needed some daylight to do it. They need a little bit longer time. So here we have Joshua who, who, who prayed a prayer. And what's fascinating about this Scripture, as you read it, the emphasis is actually not on the miracle. As amazing as this miracle is, the emphasis is actually not on the miracle. The emphasis in Scripture is on the boldness of the prayer. That Joshua was, was actually bold enough to stand in front of people and pray a prayer so dynamic that now God had to do something. Because God's reputation was on the line. It's one thing to pray bold prayers in the prayer closet, to pray bold prayers in the green room, to pray, pray bold prayers in your living room. But when you're in front of the entire nation and you begin to proclaim things about what God can do, you better believe that God can back it up. And, and Joshua prayed that kind of prayer knowing that that God was able. Joshua knew that God was sovereign. And he prayed a prayer knowing that it was a sovereign God who, who made this world. So, so it's a sovereign God who can step out of this world at any time and, and change the very laws and dynamics that He put in place so that His people can have a victory. Bold prayers. Bold prayers. Knowing not just what God can do, that's knowing his capability. You pray those prayers in private. But remember what Jesus said to the disciples? Do you still have no faith? After you've seen all that I've done, after you've seen the miracles, if you've seen the transformed lives, after everything you've seen, you still have no faith. And here we've got Joshua. He has seen victory after victory as God has called them into battle. God has also given them the victory. And now what's magnificent and fascinating to Joshua is even in the mess he got himself in, God got him out. And so there's a boldness on the inside of Joshua. To know this is not my doing, this truly is the Lord. So he had the boldness to pray an audacious prayer. Lord, would you cause the, the sun to stand still? Would you cause the moon to stay in place so that I can have victory in this season of my life where I don't know how this is going to turn out. But God, I'm appealing to you that just by faith, and He does it in front of the entire nation. Bold prayers. Bold prayers, not just knowing what He can do, but knowing why He will do it. Knowing why. It's those kinds of prayers, the, the sun stands still kind of prayers that I want a church to be able to pray over your family, to be able to pray over your finances, to be able to pray over your friendships. I want you to be able to pray sun stands still prayers over those situations in your life. That's why we didn't choose in this moment to do a financial call. I didn't want to turn this into an appeal for finances. I know God was going to come through with the amount. I know God's going to take us exceedingly abundantly over a million dollars because that's how God works. I know that He's going to create, create provision for the vision. I have faith for that. But I want, to, I want you to pray that out with God. I want you to do that with God. You're a responsible, mature believer. You can walk that out with God. But in this moment, what I wanted to do and capitalize on the atmosphere and what God's doing in our very midst is I wanted to get you to believe for you. I wanted you to get you to believe for your family. I want to get you to the point where you will pray, Son, stand still, pray over your life, over your family, over your situation, over what God has for you and yours. Thanks for listening to this podcast. For more information about Vive Church, for service times and locations, or if you'd like to support this ministry financially, visit us at vivechurch.org.